Beloved, <clears throat> do not be surprised of, at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts and minds to the fire of your Holy Spirit. Set your grace and love upon our hearts that we may see the world through the eyes of Jesus with love and hope. Amen. As most of you know, I do my sermon planning for the year over the summer. So about the middle of July last year, I decided to preach through 1 Peter for Easter. The texts were interesting. And I've never preached through 1 Peter before, so it felt like fun to focus on the issues of justice through the lens of resurrection. What I didn't know is that at this time, we'd be living in a lockdown to flatten the curve through the beginning of a pandemic. At that time, I don't think I would have known what half of that sentence even meant. And yet, I read this text on Tuesday morning and it felt like it was speaking directly to our situation. The fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you. I'm feeling fully tested and the ordeal seems to be getting more and more fiery by the day. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Boy, do I need to be reminded of that fact. You know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. We're not in this alone, and we all need each other to save as many lives as possible. Another good reminder. And finally, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. I think I might need that reminder most of all. Well, that's the sermon. Let's pray and move on. Just kidding. But it's a reminder of a bit of wisdom my preaching professor taught us in seminary. The word read well does half the work. Thank you, Grace, for reading the word well. But let's do the second half of the work together. The text seems to be speaking directly to us, and it does, but its original meaning and context was not a pandemic, but persecution. Peter is speaking to a church that is being persecuted for their faith, and he is encouraging them to persevere. He speaks of testing, noting that only those with principle will face a test. After all, if you flip-flop on everything, you suffer for nothing. He also points out that your willingness to ride through hard times reveals the level of your commitment. As the phrase goes, when the going gets tough, we give up. No, of course that's not it, right? It is the tough get going. And we're only willing to go through the tough stuff and stay tough through it 
if we believe we're on the right path. William Barclay describes it this way. When a man has to suffer for his Christianity, he is walking the way his master walked and sharing the cross his master carried. I like that idea, but I might say it a different way. When a woman suffers for walking the way of Christ, the way Jesus walks, Christ lives in her. I put the emphasis on what we do rather than what we think. But you get the idea. Now, how might this relate to our suffering? As much as people might clamor about it, we're not actually being persecuted. But we are being tested. That's for sure. And Peter's teaching becomes an important lesson for us. This is this is only a time of testing because we have a principle of caring and looking out for each other. As long as we hold on to that principle, this experience will test us. I care about other people, so I keep my distance. And that's tough. I like shaking hands, offering hugs. I like visiting people and playing games with them. I'd like to go to Ethan's graduation or host a graduation party for him. I care about other people, so I wear a mask when I go outside. That's really tough. It fogs up my glasses. It slides down my nose. But I do it because I care about others, and I want to look out for them. As the months wear on, the testing is going to get harder. I'm only going to stick to it if I believe I'm on the right path. You have to have principles, and you stick with them only as much as you believe in them. I believe this is our faith at work. This is living out what it means to follow Christ. Our principle for everything I just mentioned is found in Christ's summary of the law. He says, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as you love yourself. When we put that principle into action, we're going to get tested and we might experience suffering. Now that's the foundation of this sermon, putting our principles and action and experiencing suffering because of that. But I want to spend the rest of our time with the text talking about how we overcome that suffering. Because if we agree that loving our neighbor as we love ourselves is a principle worth suffering for, then finding support or strength to live through hardship or even overcome our suffering will be crucial for our keeping that principle, for keeping our principles even through the suffering. So how do we overcome or persevere through suffering? The first and second steps in overcoming or persevering are found in these words from Peter. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's suffering, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. Let's start the first step with a simple truth from the Buddhist faith. Existence is suffering. To exist, to be alive, is to suffer. Now, most of us are not Buddhists, but all truth is God's truth. And if you give it a bit of thought, I think you will realize our life is deeply connected to suffering. Peter knows this, and we've been reading about it for much of this letter. Almost every text has been talking about suffering in one way or another. Today, he encourages us 
in that suffering to rejoice. Not because we enjoy suffering, especially suffering that isn't Christ's suffering, but because with our heart and mind, we can know that Christ is with us in all our suffering. In other words, getting through or overcoming our suffering begins with our attitude and our thoughts while we suffer. Viktor Frankl, a man very familiar with suffering, was a psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor. He wrote these words about suffering. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. In other words, in between suffering, which is the stimulus, and our response to it, we find our heart and mind, our attitude and our thoughts. And here is where we have the power to choose. Here is where suffering and that choice leads directly to our response. And we can find our growth and freedom in that response. Peter employs us, know that you are with Christ and Christ is with you. Let this truth shape your heart and mind, your attitude and thoughts in that in-between space. And with that, you will find growth and freedom in your response to suffering. The second step is a simple principle as well. If it starts with our attitude and our mind, then Peter says, be glad and shout for joy. And that's the second half of that verse. Peter references this to the revealing of Christ's glory, but gratitude and joy are foundational to endure suffering. According to Psychology Today, we have about 40 to 70,000 thoughts a day. I know, I know, don't ask me how they figured that out. But in in looking at those thoughts, they found that about 70% of them are negative. Your natural impulse is to look for the bad. If we're going to exercise that power to choose, that, that space in between our suffering and our response, and therefore find growth and freedom, we have to actively work on it. Gratitude and joy are active choices that move you away from your natural negative thoughts and help you overcome suffering. Have you ever felt deeply grateful for something or someone and been angry or hurt at the same time? Of course not. When you experience suffering, pause for a moment in that space in between and focus on something or someone you are grateful for or find joy in. Shifting your focus to this love and appreciation enhances your empathy, strengthens your mind and attitude, and helps you overcome your suffering in your response to it. For the last step, I want to bundle three more encouragements that Peter offers us to help us through our suffering. Now, don't worry, this will go quickly. I know three more encouragements feels like another sermon. We can find these encouragements in verses six to eight. Peter says, humble yourself, cast your anxiety on God and be disciplined. 
Suffering of any kind reminds us that we are not in control. Humility is a lesson we can take from this experience. Humility pushes us to ask questions, to be curious, to not assume we know everything, and then to pause. It opens our hearts so that we pause a moment in that space between suffering and our response. It's the moment we need to choose our thoughts and attitude, to practice gratitude and joy. Humility is essential for our growth and freedom. Anxiety is rooted in fear. Fear cr cripples our ability to think. Anxiety and fear shortens the time between suffering and our response. It doesn't allow us to take the moment we need to choose our thoughts and attitudes, to actively seek gratitude and joy. Anxiety makes suffering and our response one in the same. Casting your anxiety on one who cares for you makes it possible to find gratitude and joy. God cares for you. And this is a reason to give thanks. Offer your anxiety to God but others care for you as well, and you can offer them your anxiety. Sharing your anxiety with a therapist, a friend, a partner, rather than holding it all in and carrying it yourself is crucial for finding gratitude and overcoming suffering. When you allow yourself to share it with another, you intentionally draw into your mind your gratitude and joy that they are there for you and that they can care for you. Finally, discipline. None of this works without discipline. We cannot maintain our principles, actively choose our thoughts and attitude, focus on gratitude and joy, be humble or share our anxiety and fear without discipline. Be alert. Focus during that moment between suffering and your response. For in it, you can overcome. You can grow and find freedom. We are all suffering in one way or another in our lives. We have principles and we have faith. We are called to love our neighbor and love ourselves we will suffer, but we can make it through it. We can overcome, we will overcome it. May you stay true to the faith of Christ, following our Savior through times of testing. May you shape your heart and mind with gratitude and joy. May you be humble, kind to yourself in sharing your fears and your anxiety and may you overcome in the way of Christ. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Ever vulnerable God, in the midst of this pandemic, teach us patience. Give us eyes to see each other and kindness for each other. We need the patience of Christ to practice humility as we take our first steps out into the world. We need the eyes of Christ to see your image in each other. We need the kindness of Christ to practice patience and humility with each other. You are patient with us. 
see us to the core of our being and show us kindness beyond measure. Give us faith to follow you. Merciful Savior, our anxiety and fear separates us from others. We imagine that we are alone or that our safety rests only on our shoulders. Help us to trust you and each other, for we are not alone. You always make intercession for us, and each of us is walking through this devouring storm with you. Remind us we are only as strong as we are together, and grace for each other is your way forward. Holy Spirit, you are the Spirit of God. You are the Spirit of glory. Like the wind, we struggle to see you, but you rest upon us in our time of struggle, and we feel your mercy as we offer it to each other. We know what that mercy looks like, for you give it to us in your fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Make us trees planted in the soil of your word. Give us what we need to bear this fruit for each other, that we may know your peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.